This episode of the Round 6 Podcast is brought to you by Trailer Tug, the world's strongest trailer dolly. Learn more at TrailerTug.com. Welcome to the Round 6 Podcast, a weekly roundtable discussion featuring a variety of automotive subjects, interviews, special guests, and stories. Hosted by the Round 6 Gearheads, Brian Stubsky, Alex Welsh, and Brad King. Here on episode 56, the gearheads sit with Jimmy Falschlaner of Shine Speed Shop and talk cars, road trips, and pushing hot rods with famous rock and roll guitarists. Welcome to the Round 6 Podcast. I'm Brian. I'm Brian. I'm Alex. And I'm Jimmy Shine. There we have it, man. Hey, uh, welcome, sir. Welcome aboard to uh, episode, what are we on, 56? Good to have you, sir. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Enjoy the invite. Looking forward to our conversation. Yes, are we. We, uh, we already laid the ground rules, <laughs> so we know to listen for the dial tone. Yeah, the dial tone, that's, that's, that means Jimmy has left the building. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the indicator. Well, awesome. Man. How, how's things going at the shop for you, sir? Oh, it's going real good. We're real busy. A lot of projects on the table, which is fun. It's, we have a lot of diversity, too, so we're not just pigeonholed into you know just one type of vehicle. Right now, I think we've got 14 different vehicles on the plate, oh, yeah. all in different stages. I mean, some are what we call a shave and a haircut, quick turn and burn. Get our friends and our, you know, our, our fellow hot rodders down the road safely. You know, not everything is a complete full build. And that's kind of, not many shops do that, but that's a, that's a service we like to provide as well. So not just full builds, you know, somebody needs some help with something, well, we're more than willing to jump in and, again, get them down the road safely. Oh, scam me, man. So uh, anything in the shop you can talk about, or do you have, like, top secret projects going on? I don't know. We can talk about every single vehicle. Yeah, nothing's really a secret right now. I don't think so. I could be wrong. I might just say the wrong thing and get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, you'll know in a week. <laughs> yeah, no, we've got uh, we got cars. You know, one one of which um, there are some top secret aspects to it. But Billy Gibbons, his Whiskey Runner Coupe, it's it's here in the shop right now, and we've been going back and forth with different concepts and some pretty off the wall stuff that only Mr. Billy Gibbons can do. It's a project we had started, I want to say, eight years ago, maybe back at SoCal. Um, so Pete Shapores, of course, uh, Billy, myself, and, and this idea for yet another very iconic and individual creation from the mind of Mr. Billy Gibbons and Pete and, and myself. So right now it's in our hands. And uh, Jeff Allison's been on board last six months, nine months, and, uh, working together with conceptual stuff putting together different renderings, ideas. So it's a, it's really growing. Sometimes you get to like a stumbling point when you're building these vehicles and you're like, ah, it's not talking to me right now. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to set it aside until she starts to speak again. And within the last couple of months, speaking, perhaps yelling is what the car's been doing. So, you know, starting out, man, what, what were your, what was your aspiration in life? Who were your heroes? Oh gosh. I mean, we're taking a we're taking a trip in the wayback machine right now. Growing up as a kid, my nickname is Shine. Of course, uh, that's one thing. Surprisingly enough, after as many years as I've been in this industry and and television and magazines and all the wonderful things I've been able and and, and honored to be able to do, so many people think my my real surname is Shine. And it's not. I mean, let me tell you, if, if you don't know this already, you can, you'll can you be able to see why I've got so many different nicknames. Because it's 12 letters long, Austrian, and it's Falschlaner. So everything from flashlight to flash hammer to Falschlaner, <laughs> you name it. I got, I got some mega dumb nicknames. And, uh, for whatever reason... The shine stuck, and, well, it's not my least favorite one, but I don't know. It's just kind of become part of a staple as to how everybody knows me, which I think is funny. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, you never get to 
uh, anyway, a good nickname you never get to choose. You know, you don't get to go out there and just say, this is my nickname. But at least you wound up with Shine. I mean, hell, my last name is Stupski. So try to imagine the crap I put up with, you know? Well, I'm sure you got some good ones, too. I've got some winners, man. I've I've chosen to stick with, you know, Brian. I guess I kind of... I get off on a tangent real easy. You ask me one question, and I'll talk about something else. How my early days, I, I did grow up in a very automotive, or perhaps more or less mechanical, because it kind of um, it, it it combined everything from boats to motorcycles to off road to cars to drag racing to many different elements all mixed together. Uh, my family was very eclectic that way, and. My pop did all kinds of weird, crazy stuff, so I always grew up with it. It's always seemed to have been just just what I do. I don't know. Um, I wish I had a really good reason, some divine moment as to why I do what I do. I just, oh, God, here the cat's out of the bag. I'm just simple, (laughs) and that's what I like. (laughs) But that's that's the good thing. I mean, and you couldn't be in a better... uh a better industry for that. I mean, I think simplicity is so overlooked in what we do. Well, yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I like things understated. We can, we can get very carried away. This automotive world, this hot rod world we're in is very artistic, eccentric, etc. However, I, what we, the term we call, or we use is, you know, we try to exercise restraint maintain the purity of the builds that we're doing very traditional traditional minded that we are uh, and pull from our heritage yeah it's just because you can do something doesn't mean you should so we try to really you know every vehicle we build we 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 tailor it for the owner the individual and it's purpose built we try not to deviate from our original ideas the only deviation is only to simply embellish and make them better. But then that becomes a collective decision between all of us, you know, from myself to the owner to the designers, builders. Everybody's got a voice. What what has been? I I know when uh, when I saw you doing some stuff at SoCal back, it's been a few years ago, and you were working on you were working on Billy's car, the the coupe you have in the shop right now. What that helicopter headlight is that? Is that like the craziest one of the craziest weird things you've ever been involved in? Um, I'm going to have to say that's pretty up there. Uh, I've been involved in some crazy weird stuff. I don't think, you know, right now is a platform to discuss certain activities, but okay. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm having fun. Um, well, that's probably one of the more wild ones. Billy's got some crazy weird ideas and that one just worked out. It actually came to him in a dream. He was driving out in the desert and he had this light coming out of his car and he was chasing some girl and you know what? He says it, it's a dream, but for all intents and purposes, I wouldn't be surprised if it was real. So <laughs> we found that it's actually a 24 volt landing light. And at one point, I did research the serial number on it, and I knew what kind of plane and or planes it was used in. But since then, I've forgotten. That whole linkage thing, did you have to come up with? I mean, I thought it was all part of a whole deal. Did you have to kind of figure no, that out? It, no, it was a unit. It was like this. It was a headlight in this uh, gear-driven combination electrical engine-driven motor unit that had about 20-some wires coming out of it, and they were all um, white. Every <laughs> wire was white. So at least they weren't labeled. So it was just um, uh, a process of uh, deduction i just started going through to see hooking up lights to power or wires to power to see what they did then i'd mark them and after i don't know a couple hours i had figured out what each one did from moving up down left right on off uh, all these different you know configurations see i work in the aerospace business and we don't have colored wires everything is labeled with a number so whoever cut that harness off obviously cut it past where the number was at. But the number wouldn't have served you any purpose either unless you had a, a schematic. Well, actually, I think there were numbers on it, but that still didn't yeah. mean it. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to help you. <laughs> I figured the worst, the worst that can happen, I'll be out 50 bucks if this thing, you know, explodes yeah. by the foot yeah. Oh, well. 24-volt light, the thing's probably got to work pretty well. Um, I had it hooked up to 12-volt, and it worked. And then once I put some batteries in series, it hauled ass. It worked really good. Matter of fact, like too good. Yeah, I was uh, gonna say coming in the other lane, you know, it's like, you know, well somebody's, somebody's flashing her high beams at you to kick it down. It's like, dude, you have no idea what you're about ready to get. Well, I've got two funny stories about that light. 
the first one goes back to SEMA about 2012, I think we had it there, uh, in the main lobby. I remember when it sat in the lobby. I do remember Yeah, that. so we took the car afterwards, uh, you know, Friday for a move out and go into the um, Ignited party, the SEMA Ignited. So everybody, you know, everybody unloads out of the buildings and drives down in front of the, the grand stands and gets on the main drag there and sits in traffic for three hours to make it a city walk, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> but uh, it was hot that afternoon. So it was Billy and I jumped in the coop and I was driving. And then Billy's wife, Gilly, was sitting between us. And so we did that whole parade thing and drove out and that was a lot of fun. And then by the time we got out on the on the main drag there, traffic was so bad. We were just idling for a good hour, hour and a half. And Gilly was over it. She's like, I'm going to walk there. Let me out of the car. It's hot. <laughs> so she gets out and walks away and Billy and I are just sitting there and the sun was going down. Now keep in mind, uh, that light is 24 volt. Uh, so I had a, a special unit mounted in the car cause I had two batteries hooked in parallel. However, with a series of diodes, it was charging from the alternator. So a 12 volt alternator charged each battery independently. Mr. Gibbons was having a really good time playing with his light as we were going down the road there at low speed. Low speed, what happens? Alternator doesn't charge. This thing was lighting up the side of these buildings and he was having a grand time. Well, we had made it, oh, just short of our final destination. And with this light on, all of a sudden, the, the car kind of stumbled and then sputtered and went out. And we were, I forget what the name of the street was. We are on the main street there, and the car's dead. And I've got a rock star stuck in traffic in this chopped coupe. And I went into panic. It's like, oh, dang. But I didn't say dang. I actually said something else. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Billy, you just stay in the car. I'll push just off to the side of the road. And he's like, no way, man. This is too much fun. Billy jumps out of the car. I get out of the car. And we're pushing, you know, this Chop 34 Ford <laughs> down the street. And so sure enough, all these people, we had all these volunteers and people push or helped us get over the side of the road. We got jumper cables and we fired this thing back up. And then Billy went to put his hand back on that control to start that light again, and I smacked him good and hard. <laughs> Touch this damn thing. <laughs> that was funny. So we did make it. Battery was dead. Billy had a good time. Just that's just crazy stuff that that happens. And then the other story was was it Conan O'Brien? It's like a talk show, right? Right. Okay. Okay. I'm just trying to. I think that's his name. Big yeah. tall guy with funny Bob's big boy hair. <laughs> so ZZ Top was invited to do 16 Tons, the song 16 Tons on, uh, on the Conan O'Brien show. So we had Whiskey Runner on stage, and because the light was so bright, we kept it down in the hood and just kind of turned on so it would shine up like the Luxor in, uh, in Vegas. And so as Billy stand next to the car playing, and this was... Thankfully, during the rehearsal, when I was standing or sitting like in the front row, this thing, somebody had touched the light with their fingers. Oh. And what happens is, you probably very well know, <laughs> that oil from your fingers, it, it creates a different surface tension on the glass. So as that glass gets really hot, it has different contraction and or expansion ratios. And so as they're practicing 16 tons and all these cameras are on them and all this, and Billy Gibbons is about four feet away from the hood of this car, this thing all of a sudden starts to smoke. And I'm just thinking, oh, no, oh, no. I'm thinking Michael Jackson, Pepsi commercial, 1984. <laughs> Burns his beard off. <laughs> I'm the guy that's responsible. It's like, oh, shit, the lawsuit, I'm going to get off of this. I'm in trouble now. So that thing starts smoking. Before I could jump up, it burst. Glass goes everywhere. Billy doesn't even move. It's like part of the theatrics. And like, man, I went in there like this was World War II, and I came out of my foxhole and I jumped on to save his life from the grenade. So thankfully, he didn't burst into flames. And his, his beard was saved. <laughs> and we were on TV. We'll have to we'll have to do a video version of this here. We can show off how they had to graft back together your midsection. Now you no longer have a belly button. This would be great.
that was really honestly a pretty terrifying moment. It was like I was screwed up. When you were when you were younger, um, Jeff was talking about you. Uh, you left Orange County and you went to New Orleans with this this crazy road trip. Um, obviously, you like adventure. That's not really a problem for you. So, what? <laughs> Uh, you guys went with with no game plan. What was what was that road trip? What was the whole deal there? That was twenty one years old, and I'm a man always looking for a good time. Didn't say I was terribly smart, <laughs> you know. But uh, yeah, I, I had a '56 Merc Monterey. Uh, I had a little Y block in it, and it was uh, this was before bags or anything like that it was real prominent. And I just had it, you know, cut on the spring, real low, functional lake pipes. Uh, it was like a primer black with Larry Watson style scallops all over it. And it was kind of a beater, but it was a lot of fun. Had no side windows, no back seat, no upholstery. <laughs> I mean, it was kind of an uh, unfinished car. And I had a buddy of mine that was uh, in the Coast Guard, and he just got stationed uh, right there in Louisiana, not too far from Bourbon Street. So my buddy Tim Beitler had called me up on a Sunday afternoon, and he was talking. We hadn't seen each other in a while, and he said, well, you know, I'm stationed here in Louisiana. You ever get some free time? You ought to come down here. I just went to Bourbon Street with some with some buddies, and it was a lot of fun. And I said, yeah, that sounds like that'd be cool. Yeah, as soon as I get some free time, maybe I'll head on down. So I got off the phone with him, and I thought, well, I got some free time right now. Called him back. I said, I'm leaving in the morning. <laughs> so uh, I remember looking at a globe. <laughs> this is how smart I am. I look at a globe. Well, I'm here on this globe, planet Earth. <laughs> I'm looking at the continental U.S. Here's California and here's this bourbon. Man, it's only about a thumb and a half away. How long could that take? Well, <laughs> it's about 38 hours, it turns out. So that was an experience driving through, see, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Louisiana. Um, and the whole time, here, here's the other key part of this story. Not only did I not have any windows in the car, I didn't have any working gauges. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I did have the presence of mind to have two five-gallon jugs of gas in the trunk just in case I did run out of gas. I figured 10 gallons can get me where I need to go. And it did, because I used that a few times. But that's just a funny story, being a hot rod dumb kid with buddies driving our dumb cars across the country to go have an adventure. And there's, there's a lot more to that story, too. But I think we're just going to move to the next. <laughs> and maybe not have it on the radio. There you go. Is my mom listening to this station? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody listens. She probably to already station. knows half the crap that I've pulled. So, how bad can it be? She just wants you to think that she doesn't know. <laughs> yeah. so you're talking oh, young sure kids she... and hot rods. What was your first hot rod? Well, first car I had, I bought when I was 14. 42785 was the date. Actually, it's almost been exactly however many years. Today's the 23rd. 42785. I bought a 1940 Willys uh, pickup oh, truck. All steel body, two front steel clips, stock chassis, everything, nine hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> nice, wow. yeah. Nine. That could get you a headlight <laughs> ring nowadays. <laughs> oh my, yeah, it wouldn't even get you that. And I thought it was, I was like, I think that was in eighth grade, and I went to school because I found it in the newspaper, and it was West in West Covina. So my dad drove me out there, and we went, and we looked at this thing, and it was a hunk of crap, but I loved it. I mean, it was all rusty. I mean, it was. You know, at that at that time, 1985, when I went to school the next day and I saw my buddies in the quad and we started talking, I'm like, man, I bought a car and everybody's excited. You got a car? Wow. And I told them what it was and they're like, okay, so can we go drive it? Not exactly. <laughs> and so um, the next weekend I went and rented a trailer and had my dad haul this thing back to my parents' house. And my friends came over and I have pictures my buddy Gary that just came over a couple of weeks ago. I got a picture of him in my driveway, my parents' house, like three or four of my buddies. And they're all laughing so hard they're crying. It's like, you are the dumbest human being I've ever met. It's like, <laughs> why did you buy that? And it, it made me sad. But it took me, uh, that was 427.85, 429.87. 
I drove it for the first time. It took me two years and two days. And I, I've, I've got these stupid dates stuck in my head. I don't, I'm not exactly sure of my wedding anniversary. I should know. I think it's coming up. But I'll remember the first time Better I bought check. a car the first time I drove it. Yeah. No, I don't think I don't think my wife's listening to this, so I'm probably safe. <laughs> I'm gonna write a note to myself right yeah, now. Yeah, write it on your hand. It's out your anniversary so he doesn't kill you. What did you drive like after two years of putting it together yourself? Was it a decent driver? Oh yeah, I mean I built my own tube chassis. I took the the stock nineteen forty Willie's chassis and I think I sold it for fifty dollars. Uh, but at that time nobody cared. Right. Um, right. I built my own tube chassis, designed my own four-length suspension, uh, did a narrow nine-inch forward in the rear. I used a 40 Willys front axle parallel leaf. I used 6140 line spindles uh, and drums. Uh, and then I took, I bought a Corvair steering box at the Pomona Swap Meet for $5. And I took it to my high school metal shop class, and I got the bearings, and then I machined it on the lid, and I reversed it. So my steering shaft came out the other way for whatever reason. I don't know why I did it. But, uh, I mean, for being a 14, 15-year-old kid, the, the car's still on the road. Uh, a guy named Robert owns it, and he lives up in Eagle Rock. And I think it has a blown 454 in it now. But it's still on the road. Been blessed to have a, a lot of different experiences and different vehicles. Just been really cool. Be in the right place at the right time, but also... Have you put together anything to replace your little blown flathead pickup truck that you sold not too long ago? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I put together a, about an 8,500 square foot building full of cars. <laughs> How's it run? That's been my replacement. <laughs> That's been my replacement. I've got plans to do some other stuff. Um, I've got that uh, injected alcohol motor out of my uh, 1968 John Shoemaker Dragster. Uh, it's all Motown. I kept that. So I've got plans uh, to put together a Lakester or go back to Bonneville. I like going fast. I like going to Bonneville. It's, it's like being on, you know, on another planet. You're just focused about your friends and your car and going fast and it's kind of like surfing. Everything just goes away. It's it's kind of a focused, wholesome place. Well, and you got a redhead at Bonneville. That's always a, that's always an awesome thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was very fortunate to be able to do that. Um, well, I was going to bring that up because that, uh, that was a great tie-in with one of our previous guests and, and a friend of, well, a mutual friend of all of ours, uh, Tony Thacker. Yeah. Um, yeah, that story starts back in the 1990s as well when I was racing uh, a BSA production class at Miroc and El Mirage. And, uh, Mid-90s is when I met Tony Thacker. And we became friends. And then a few years later, after, you know, he was, of course, from England, but always grew up enamored with the magazines and the stories about Bonneville and the dry lakes and the salt racing. And I was racing a, a bike for a, a club that I was in and doing good, having a lot of fun. And, and Tony went to the races. And then we had another mutual friend that had a car that was for sale, a little 29 Model A Ford Roadster. That had done well. It had been pretty fast, 150, 160. And he wanted to sell the car. So then Tony approached me. He's like, would the, if I be the wallet, would you be the shoe or the wrench and drive this thing and work on it? Because I don't know exactly what to do. It's like, hell yeah, dude, I'm in. So that started our little campaign in about 2001, I think. We just had this little Model A Roadster with a Chevy. Uh, we drive it out to El Mirage, pull the windshield off, uncork the exhaust, and do 138 miles an hour with it, you know, do a couple hits over the course of a weekend, and bolt the windshield back on it and drive home. It was a, it was a lot of fun. And the bug kind of gets you. It's like, well, if we can go 135 or 140, we can do 145. We can do 150. So we kind of started chasing that carrot uh, for a few years. And lo and behold, by 2006, we were running uh, D-blown street, uh, injected, intercooled, and chasing the 203-mile-an-hour record. But uh, it's the same car we drove all the way to Bonneville. And I, I think the fastest we ever did was driving to Bonneville. I bolted the blower on and all that once we got there. Just drove it up there with a carburetor and a different fuel system. Bolted the 871 blower on it and the dual hollies and we went out after driving 648 miles 
ran 192 before we grenaded the transmission. But in 2006, we were chasing a 203 record and we qualified at 208 and then backed it up at 204. We got the record at 206, 454. I'm looking over to my coat rack in my office where I've got my red jacket with those numbers embroidered on the back, and I'm very proud of it. That's it awesome. took a lot of people and a long time to do. There's a Bonneville story. A great Bonneville story. Very cool. So now you had mentioned earlier, uh, you know, you, you enjoy surfing. Do you, do you still surf today? Oh, not as much as I like to. I don't know. I, I find myself at the shop pretty much seven days a week unless I'm traveling. And this is actually something I've been talking with the guys about. My wife is like, I got to get back into getting up early and going surfing just to start my day. Hopefully not drown or get bit by a shark. <laughs> get your whole new nickname. Yeah, I guess uh, who's calling in sick today? No, but that's, that's, uh, that's something I really love to. Did you know I was going to be a professional surfer? I did not. No. Yeah, the only thing I lack is talent. Oh, nice. Yeah, you, you and I. Yeah, we, we, we both could have been great. that didn't from building cars now, did it? <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, like, I, I'm kind of so have, have you always surfed? What, I mean, well, obviously, since you were born anyway, I mean, you, you could have done that in a womb, I guess. But, you know, did you surf as a kid? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, from like junior high school time. So like, you know, 12, 13. Before that, I was going to the beach with my dad, you know, longboard and splashing around. But actually being able to surf, which is actually quite a difficult task. Especially when you lack the talent that I do, but uh, yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's 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 part of our Southern California culture, from BMX to skateboards to surfing to motorcycles to all that fun stuff. It's it's kind of um, yeah, this is probably the only place really that we've got the weather and the, the ability to do just to, to do all of that. Yeah, because I mean, I, it's just I was wondering because it, it's funny. I mean, living on the coast, it's kind of expected that you you'd surf. Uh, I was just wondering because you don't see, uh, I mean, it's kind of weird looking at your work. You don't see a lot of that kind of surf influence make its way into your cars. And I'm not saying that you do like themey type cars, which, and I thank you for not being that guy. Thank but, you. But, you know, that that whole, you know, you don't see a whole lot of that kind of, uh, that, that sort of look, you know, kind of making its way into the cars. Yeah, I don't think anything we do is too gimmicky or themey that's that's left for other people it's just not our thing or, or my thing no um no but very much that's southern california inspiration I, i've been all over the world i can go to different countries or even different parts of the continental u.s and i'll see a car and i can tell you probably where it's from you know within a couple states i mean i think Think there's there is enough of a difference so i do think to some degree that our cars do have that southern california west coast influence you know and some of that you know is derived from the, the beach the surfing the skateboards the dry lakes i think all of that you know inclusive yeah. not gimmicky but i think very much inspired how about that definitely yeah, yeah. Uh, thank yeah. you that 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 articulated Kind of where I was trying to go with that, uh, much better than I did. So, uh, you know, because for me, you know, it's just it's kind of funny. You have an interest in something, and to kind of compartmentalize it versus, you know, versus making it just part of everything you do it is kind of a tough deal sometimes. That's kind of cool to see that you keep those two kind of separate. Well, separate but together at the same. It's a, again, I take a lot of inspiration from many different facets of this wonderful world that we live in and it's funny where it does come from you you kind of mentioned too i mean growing up you have that that similar hot rod background that everybody seems to share we all seem to start with bmx bikes yeah i had a webco by the way well before i had a schwinn stingray with the really cool little attachment for the rear the rear uh, uh axle the little things that came up and all oh, that was bitching <laughs> But then my dad built a side hack bicycle. We took that same Schwinn and then cut up, used a hacksaw and cut up some, I found them in the ditch, shopping carts. And then my dad gas welded them all together when I was like six. So I had a little a side hack bicycle. Heck yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> 
So then, of course, we built the first one, and all the neighbor kids had to have one. So my dad had a had a job, and it was it was cool to have your pop be the guy that was the welder, and all the kids, all the neighborhood kids, used to hang out at our house. That's where there was dune buggies and motorcycles and bicycles and sometimes things on fire. You never can tell, but it was a. <laughs> It was the popular place to be. You could find your neighborhood. And there, there were no shopping carts in the Safeway parking lot. <laughs> oh, no, it was cool. It was right across the street from our house. It was pretty much where Tustin ended. And it was all orange groves and cornfields. And so we'd go hunting out there. And, you know, this is back before it was all concrete and mini malls. Um, we all remember those days. The salad days. We're riding our motorcycles down like the main strip in town. and. We knew all the cops by name because they would chase us and they'd catch us from time to time. But it's like we weren't really committing a real big crime or nothing. Probably go to prison for life now if the kids yeah. did that. Those were the good days, yeah. I mean, and that that all kind of came to an end like as the '80s closed out. That was the sad part. Yeah. It really did. You know what? I mean, it's it's, it's different now. I, I to some degree, to well. Having the privilege of growing up in the 70s and 80s and all that, I, I see what kids, what they're doing today, and I, I think it's become kind of our responsibility to keep these kids you know, interested and, and involved. I think every generation is concerned with the generation coming up behind them, sure. that they're going to lose that love and that tradition and that heritage. And, and I think that's a good fear to have. I mean, if we were complacent, we, we wouldn't. We'll chase it and endorse it. Here, here, I, there is a circle. I will make sense at some point here in my story. <laughs> but circling back to like the 80s, uh, probably the late 80s, early 90s is when things really started to change. I mean, cell phones, and I'm, I'm sure everybody's sick and tired of hearing it. But it, it was just different. It was different. And imagination and ability and all that was uh, paramount. Now today, it just seems different with the kids. But every time I say that, Tomorrow, some kid's going to walk in here and, and you know, be 17 years old and, you know, driving some mini truck that he's lowered and figured out and cut the chassis and done four link and like, holy crap, you're a millennial and you were born in 2004? What? You know? Yeah. So it's, I, I think, again, you know, it's always our concerns, but we're surprised from time to time. I'm not sure what the question was, but somewhere in there, I want you guys to dig deep and find it that I made a point. You, you <laughs> did, and, and it's, it's not even going to be like a miracle of editing thing. It's going to work out great. Um, you know, we, we had talked about that a lot in the past on the show, is trying to keep the younger generation going. And one of the points that comes up all the time is just getting these kids into the seat of a car and letting them feel that car you know, smell that thing when it's running, you know, feel what it's like to rip off from the light in that thing. Cause that, that totally changes your world. I mean, the first ride in any car just clicks on a switch if you're wired for it. I mean, mm -hmm. I know there's guys who aren't wired for that stuff and they go off and do whatever it is other people do. I'm not sure what that is either. I like the way you kind of <laughs> branched off to that. No, I, I totally agree. Um, I think the first thing is, you know, I'm sitting here looking at a picture up on my computer right now, just remembering a, an old Jeep and being out in the sand dunes with my kids. And just that feeling of, you know, driving something, feeling that power, feeling how that machine works to feel a clutch and a brake and steering and shifting, but then to actually get involved with it, like, oh, let's take this tire off. I mean, I know it sounds simple and dumb, but, you know, to, to fix some brakes, to change some spark plugs, most kids, I mean, I know grown adults who haven't even done that. Yeah. And to feel yeah. like you're a part of that and you can make this machine, it's an extension of yourself. You can make this machine work and operate. Um, I've seen a lot of kids get the hook from, from doing just exactly that. And I think it's that garage culture thing. You, know, you If you grow up around it, you start off doing the, the really shitty jobs you know at the beginning where somebody hands you, you know, an intake manifold and they're like, well, clean this up, prep it for paint. And you feel like you feel like it's the worst job in the world because there you are with this greasy, nasty part. You're trying to wire brush it and make it look good. But later on, you grow and you go, okay, I understand why they had me do that before I moved on to the next thing. You know, and pretty soon you're the guy chasing down threads or you're the guy in charge of, you know, assembling the engine or something like that. That's 
well, that's I the cool stuff you don't get today. That that's that's very very good. There's one part you missed in there talking about that greasy dirty manifold. That is a dirty shitty job. But when it's all said and done, you have this sense of accomplishment. It's clean. You've done this. You've taken this horrific thing. You've made it clean. Next thing you know, you got it done and painted. And, you know, and somebody's taking it from you and bolting it on this engine and using polished stainless or ARP hardware. It's this sense of accomplishment and this, uh, this, this thought that, wow, if I can do that, I bet I can do this too. And that's, and that's what really instills in them this, this, this quest to go further and learn and do more. It's, it's the accomplishment factor. Yeah, you're going to go through the shit part of it, doing something you don't want to do. But when it's all said and done, it's that sense of accomplishment that, that really pushes you further. Exactly. And I think it, it instills in all of us that that weird feeling where we have to uh, kind of like either like look for someone's approval, because you always want the coolest guy in that garage to look at the work that you did and go, yeah, nice job. And I think that kind of branches out further. That's why we have car shows and trophies. <laughs> yeah. No, that's very true. And, and you know what? I, I think car shows and trophies, um, I know people have different thoughts on that and such, but I, I take that seriously. You know, there's there's nothing cooler than, you know, when I was a kid and I had Gene Winfield come up and look at my car and go, hey, kid, wow, and put his hand on your shoulder and say, nice job. Holy crap. You know what that does to somebody when they look up to their hero and then they hear those words of encouragement? You know, I, and I, I, I've been honored to uh, present trophies at uh, different events and such and where I get to be a celebrity. And I take that seriously. I, I you know, I, I have, I make custom make trophies and such. And I, I think, I don't know. I just know that how much it meant to me when somebody I thought that I looked up to recognize the work that I've done. Oh, oh just talk about, yeah, it, it's, it's humbling. And it just makes you feel good, and it it uh, inspires you to do more again. So that stuff's uh, very well. There's a reason why we do that, and uh, I think these people deserve recognition. Everybody deserves recognition for for their for their efforts and their time and their their vision, their artistic ability. Again, find a point in there someplace. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's tons of point in that, man. It, and that kind of led me to the next big question too. Okay, playing playing the part of celebrity. I mean, you've been fortunate enough to do what a lot of guys really struggle and work hard to do, and your work paid off. You you've become like that guy. You're you're one of the the heroes and celebrities in our industry. What what's it like to transition from you know kid in the shop doing you know the menial task to inspiring the next guy that who's going to get to do well the menial task i'm still that kid doing the menial task <laughs> i just cleaned no, up the 50 that's, that's pony that's the and, right. and actually my feet and my pants are wet right now because what i was doing uh hosing this thing down um i don't know i i don't really I, I do know that i've been on tv i've seen it i was there but i'm not really any celebrity or anything like that but the modicum of fame that i have achieved I do take that very seriously. It's something you have to respect, especially when people hold you uh, on a, a higher pedestal. You can't let them down. They can't let them find out you know, that you are a jerk. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing my best to hide that fact. <laughs> I'm a jerk. Oh, crap. I haven't really transitioned, I don't think, because I don't think I am. I don't think I am that person. I, I would venture to say, I mean, you, you, you obviously, you, you have the respect of, you know, both your peers and the average guy out there who's, who's working. So, I mean, heck, that, that's a great place to be, man. You know, a lot of people go their entire lives and never get that respect. Yeah, no, I, I'm very, very privileged. And I've, I've, I do think I am lucky in that aspect. I, I've never had any aspirations to do anything. I, I just like playing with my cars. I like playing with cars and motorcycles and ideas, and I like to build things with my hands. This whole thing that you know we're going to talk about being on TV, that's just a byproduct of what I do. Um, you know, at first it's like, what, they want to put me on TV? Oh, hell yeah, I'm in. <laughs> and now it's like, well, I mean, if it fits, if I can do it, if it's fun, you know, like anything, uh, I, I've done it for quite some time, and 
there has been things that I didn't like about it. I, I didn't like being controlled or told what to say or what to do or produced. And, you know, sometimes I'm opinionated and I'm outspoken. And I think I might have made a couple people angry, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, um, I just want to do what's right. I did work with the production company and nothing was ever aired, thankfully. But, you know, it was kind of making a mockery of this thing that I hold so true. You know, this history from the hot rods and the racing and, you know, my heroes like Pete Chaporis and Art Crisman, Alex Exidius, all, all my friends, all these people that I, I looked up to as a kid, as a hero. And then as I became a man, these heroes, I was able to call my friends. And that, that's a serious responsibility, too. You know, I talked to Pete before Pete passed away. It's like, I, I, I will never make a mockery of this. I don't want to do some of these certain TV shows that are, you know, off the deep end. Yeah, and it, it, see, that's an awesome attitude to have, and I, and and thank, thanks for, you know, thanks for vocalizing that. I think that's a really cool thing, and I, you've got a great attitude about it. You know, the the funny thing is too, it's like your your earlier TV shows, you were on kind of in the infancy of this whole weird kind of automotive reality thing, and it's so weird to see how that's changed and kind of altered. I mean. You know, it's funny how it, it goes from it was, you know, it started off with certain shows that were all about the build. Then it became all about the drama. And now it's yeah. kind of circling back around. Yeah, I think they've got a pretty good format. And they, I think at this point, until something really new comes out, it's just regurgitating and, and, and just doing the same old format. Do it for a year or two until it grows old and then fit it with this other format until that, you know, um, rotates back. You know, I'm, I, I've got some thoughts and some ideas that I would like to see happen. I mean, I, I would be totally interested in pursuing that and doing more fun car you know, TV show stuff. Yeah. Earlier, you mentioned Pete Chaporis. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you guys hooked up and and how all that came to be. A lot of good stories out there. You should put this down in a book that no one will ever read. Um, back in the mid-'90s, I was building my hot rods and bikes, and I had a low rider truck. And I was living at the beach and surfing every day. And at that time, uh, I was driving a concrete truck. And really bitching Peterbilt, all polished Alcoas. Oh, I was was nuts over that thing. But again, I was just doing hot rod stuff for myself. And then I uh, got a call from a friend of mine saying, "Hey, uh, I heard Pete Chaporis is looking for young guys that are." you know, hot rodders, bikers that have talent that, you know, could go to work for them, you know, if, if you know anybody. And I'm like, man, dude, I don't know. I don't know anybody that could go to work for Pete Shapores. So, uh, yeah, uh, kind of a dead end here. And he's like, no, Nimrod, I'm talking about you. I'm like, me? For Dr. Pete Shapores? What the hell for? That guy's going to laugh me right out of the office. And I thought about it. And my friend called me back. And I go, well, what the hell? I'll call up there and see if I can get an appointment with him. And I, and that's back when it was PC 3G before SoCal. And <clears throat> I called, talked to him, real nice guy. Of course, I knew who he was. And actually, used to live down the street from him in Temple City back in the early 70s. And Pete and Jake's was right there on Las Tunas, you know, a couple blocks from my grandmother's antique store. So I knew it very well, but I didn't know him personally or anything like that. And uh, made an appointment to go to see him. And real nice gentleman. Drove all the way from Sacramento to Pomona. It was like 65 or 70 miles each way. And I took him a portfolio of all my cars and bikes and different stuff I'd done. And at this time, I'm 25, 26 years old. And um, I talked to him. I left my portfolio with him. And then a week later, he called me back. So, well, I'd like to come, have you come in again. And so I did. I drove back up to Pomona and went in his office. And by this time, I want to say it was either May or June, but it was really hot. And <laughs> Pomona. So I go into Pete's office. And he's like, well, I, well, I want to talk to you about this. So I've been through your portfolio. I like all these pictures and all this. And I want, I want you to go to work for me. He's like, I'd, I'd like to offer you a position. And I said, well, really? And it was left. Than what I was making driving a concrete truck, but are you kidding? The opportunity to go to work for Pete was just too much. So we talked, 
and um, there's some other funny little sidebars here as well but right before he said he would hire me he goes i got one more question for you and i said yes sir what's that he says why the hell are you wearing a long sleeve black t-shirt in pomona in june and it's 110 degrees and i went okay now you remember this is like 1996. i'm like oh shit. it's like uh, the reason is, is because I got like sleeved tattoos. And so I pull up my sleeves and his eyes, he's looking at all my tattoos on my arms. And he grabs my hand. He's like, looking at, I've got this big ship on this one arm and stuff like that. And he's like, huh? Hmm. And then he leans back and he grabs his uh, right arm. He grabs his left sleeve and he pulls up his shirt. He goes, well, this tattoo here I got from Jack Rudy. At about five in the morning, and then this one over here, and it's like, whew, man, I just wiped the sweat off my forehead. I thought it was the funniest thing. He's like, no, I've got. I said, well, sir, you know, honestly, it's like I'll wear a long sleeve, you know, shirt if I need to. I don't want to, you know, look bad to your company or whatever. He goes, no, I don't see a problem with it at all, as long as you're, you know, a respectful young man. He's like, I think tattoos are cool as hell, and I want to get even more. There's my pizza porous uh, job interview. Why am I wearing a long sleeve shirt in June? Story. <laughs> it's gonna make a great title for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> a long one. Yeah. yeah, when you hired in at SoCal down there, it was like a, a, a bunch of superstars working down there. He had quite a crew. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, we had Bill Stewart. You know, Birdman. You know, he was. Uh, he chopped the ZZ Top, the Eliminator Coop, uh, John Carambia, Timmy Beard. I mean, those were the two guys that painted Eliminator. Um, God, yeah, Jim Jacobs, Jake, uh, Mike Cardenas, Shane Weckerly. Shane's now head of, I think, R&D at Holly. We're at Holly, right? Uh, yeah, well, we were bunkies back in the 90s because we both lived so far away from SoCal because I lived at the beach. It was just too hard. We'd work, you know, until too late at night. So we had this one little office room set up with a microwave oven, a picnic table, a cot, and a bunk bed. So I got dibs on the bottom bunk. Shane got top bunk. So we were bunkies. <laughs> he was he was telling me the story about that one night when we were at the uh, we were out at dinner one night at the SEMA show. And he was telling me that story. It's so awesome. <laughs> oh, well, there's there's quite a few Shane Weckerly, Jimmy Shine stories. Uh, <laughs> some of which I'm sure you've heard, so don't repeat it. <laughs> I did make him mad a couple times. Oh, that's funny stuff. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the SoCal back in the in the 90s, that was quite the place to be. Uh, God, I can't believe it's been like 20-some-odd years now. That's the thing, yeah. What a, what other career can you say you have that much of a good time with? And you've, you know, and I don't think there's another industry where you get to interact this much with your heroes and icons. And eventually, just call everybody a friend. So before before we dive into other stuff, I guess the big question to kind of close out this portion: What is on the horizon for for you and, and the shops? Oh gosh, I am. You know, we're growing. We're growing quite a bit. Having started just, uh, or taken the Jimmy Shine or the Shine, you know, from the umbrella of SoCal, I've always had my own uh, identity or uh, entity through SoCal. But still, it was kind of a different transition there to go from SoCal and Pete um, to this business here in Orange. Uh, it's, it's going very well. I'm, I'm really getting much, much deeper in the business side of it. Uh, my wife, she's the CFO. She runs, um, you know, all of our office work and such. And we've got uh, Jeff Allison doing a lot of our uh, creative design and, and renderings and working with customers. And Brandon Johnson, he's the um, uh, shop foreman. And we've got Mike Arnold and Paolo Dostoglerian and a couple other people. And so we're... we're becoming a really good team a really good tight-knit team and right now our main focus on the future is uh, uh, validating our name and, and building good cars and seeing where the future takes us two steps forward no steps back having fun building our cars and traveling and we got great friends great clientele eclectic unique cars every day is exciting every day is new um probably fire brandon tomorrow though <laughs> Yeah, that guy, you got to fire his ass. 
Just saying. <laughs> Just tell him that losing him is like gaining two good people. <laughs> that, that gets an applause. I, I like that. Losing him is like getting two good people. I like that. Well, well thank you again. And oh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, man. And we'll talk to you soon. All right. Oh, uh, I can't wait. Big thanks once again to our sponsor, Trailer Tug. Please visit them at TrailerTug.com and learn more about the world's strongest trailer dolly. Our listeners receive 10% off their order when they use the discount code ROUND6 at checkout or when calling their order in. 